So today, before I start, I will uh, explain what is a spin lock, why it's so hard to implement it in user land, and how can we possibly solve this. So uh, we have a locking mechanism because uh, if people want to write multi-thread applications, probably sometime an application, you need to compete for uh, a resource. So we want to make sure that this resource is only accessible by only one uh, thread. And for that, we have a lot of different locking mechanisms, really. People are very creative. The most basic and famous one are mutexes and spin locks. But we ha also have uh, semaphores, barriers, read-write lock. On the kernel end, we have a lot of different uh, crazy things, like RCUs, sick count, we have per CP operations. And writing locks is so, uh, it's so hard that we also have people that really try to avo avoid dealing with, with locks and create lockless structures and algorithms. Uh, so, for instance, if you're writing a multi-thread bank application, you probably uh, want to uh, change your account balance to only one thread per time. Because otherwise, if you receive money from two people different at the same time, maybe uh, just one operation will be committed and we will lose some money. So, this is a very basic multi-thread application. Uh, this is how it looks like. So I will start explaining a little bit about mutexes because I think it's uh, the most simple uh, lockless algorithm, uh, sorry, locking uh, primitive, and is the one that is uh, re most used on user space. So mutexes mean uh, mutual exclusion. So basically just one thread per time will uh, have access to the critical section. Um, on Linux, that means that the thread that is waiting for the lock is, is sleepable and printable. So if you are waiting for a lock, you will sleep. Uh, the thread uh, will uh, give back to the kernel that time slice, so the kernel can uh, print your uh, CPU to do something else. And on Linux, we use full text for that. So we do a context switch and give the time to the kernel to do something else. So let's say that we have two CPUs, uh, and the first the CPU zero get the lock and do the work on the critical section, and the CPU one uh, do a context switch, go to sleep, waiting for the lock to be free, so we can finally take the lock, work on the critical section, and free the lock. Uh, but there's a problem here, because uh, usually the critical section is very short, and, but doing a context switch in nowadays after uh, the CPU vulnerabilities is very, very expensive. If you want to move from the user land to the kernel and back, this can take a lot of time. So uh, very contact case with small critical sections can suffer using mutexes because instead of doing the work that you are supposed to do, you are wasting a lot of CPU cycles just locking and unlocking it's uh, preemptible and doing the context switch, you're not really wasting the time, your CPU time doing the work. Um, so for instance, let's say that we have uh, three threads, one on each CPU doing the work. And you can see here in the example, the critical section is very small. And then uh, the CPU zero gets a lock. The CPU wants, the CPU one wants to take the lock, but unfortunately it's too late and goes sleeping. Uh, is sleeping uh, and doing the contact switch is so expensive that it can be that another thread on the CPU 2 can take the lock when it's free and the CPU 0 can take it again and so on and CPU 1 only will get the lock way after. So CPU can starve because of unfortunately scheduling. Uh, so well, why we do a contact switch? Maybe we can just spin them. Uh, instead of sleeping. Um, so spin locks is basically uh, you waste, you use CPU cycles to check for the lock, to try to take it. And this is probably the most basic spin lock ever. So basically uh, you loop forever, you try to take the lock. If you take the lock, that's good, you break. If, you, if not, you just loop again and once again you try to take the lock. So keep spinning, spinning, uh, and this is 
this should be, be very fast. Uh, you can get the lock faster without contact switch, without need, the need to go to the kernel. Just get the lock and that's it. Uh, so the idea, ideal image would be like that. You just, at, as soon as you get unlock, you just, uh, this, the, the CPU one will get the lock and that's it, let's go. <coughs> but it's not that simple because user space has no role in saying what the text, what, what test, what the test handler should do. Uh, so that means that we can waste a lot of cycles spinning for something that is not even running. So let's say that the CPU zero gets a lock and the test handler decides to preempt this thread in the middle of the critical section to, to do some other work. And in the meanwhile, CPU one is spinning, but this is just a waste of CPU cycles. Uh, because you are spinning for nothing, you are spinning for something that is not going is not going to be available, and then you need to the test scheduler to preempt again uh, to CPU to, to give the the thread again the the time slice so you can finish the job and unlock the the spin lock, and that is even a worse scenario that you may be spinning against the lock owner. So let's say that we have thread A and thread B, and they are both working on the CPU zero. So thread A gets a lock, and thread B is preempted on the same CPU, and, and now you start spinning. But you're spinning for something that is not on any CPU. So you're spinning for something that is not going to be released. So you're just wasting CPU cycles, and you're in the way of the thread A. So you are making even less likely that the lock will be free. In the kernel, uh, we can implement um, locking mechanism with uh, a totally different way because in the kernel we have all the resource in our hand. We know exactly uh, which threads are running, which threads are sleeping, uh, on which uh, we know on which CPU the, the threads are, are running. Uh, you can disable preemption, so you can make sure that your thread will run for the whole critical section, and uh, you can check if the lock holder is running or not. And uh, if for that to work well, we have some rules for using spin locks on the kernel. Uh, you can't sleep while holding a spin lock. That means that uh, you, you need to disable preemption and interrupts and you need to keep the critical section as small as possible. So back to user land, uh, we would like to spin just when the lock holder is running, when we are sure that the lock, the lock holder is working. But uh, there's no current mechanism to do that on, on the Linux for the user space to ask if any given thread is actually uh, running or not and we can't disable preemption. So these are the challenges for implementing. So we need to, uh, need to, uh, to have a way to check if a given thread is running, but talking to the kernel is really expensive. If we do a syscall, with, if we add something on ProcFS, uh, as I said before, the context switch is very expensive. So if we create a syscall for checking if a given thread is running or not, Maybe this will be way bigger than the critical section and we are not really solving the problem. And now there is the question, is there a cheap way to talk to the kernel about the state of a given thread? Let's see. So now I want to introduce uh, restartable sequences. Um, so restartable sequences were created to solve a kind of similar problem here. Uh, the idea was from Paul Turner, but uh, the implementation is from Matteo. Uh, it's a Linux kernel user API uh, implemented by the RSEC syscall. These enable user space to have efficient per CPU operations without locks. And as I said before, uh, user threads can prevent CPU migration or preemption. So RSEC creates an artificial way for having atomic context on user land. Uh, so I simplified the struct here, but, but basically when you start a user thread, you call the RSEC syscall, 
with um, passing a struct with some data. Uh, the kernel will uh, fill the CPU ID for you to tell you on which CPU you are running. But user space needs to provide uh, some information like the start instruction pointer for the start of the critical section, the post commit instruction pointer for the end of uh, pointing to the end of the critical section, and the abort instruction pointer uh, that is used if something goes wrong. So the way it works is basically uh, you tell the kernel they start and end of the critical section, and if during the critical section the kernel uh, prompts you, the kernel will check the current instruction uh, IP and compare with the boundaries. And if the kernel notices that, uh, well, uh, I just prompted or migrated as a thread during a critical section, uh, that means that the peer CPU operation will not be atomic, so we need to abort operation. So before the kernel moves back uh, the thread um, the, the user thread, it will move the instruction pointer directly, directly to the abort IP, and the abort handler can do whatever is needed. Usually that means uh, to restart the sequence for their start IP, to try again to do it atomically. And uh, Matthew did some measures, and usually um, the atomic operation succeeds, usually is quite hair uh, that you need to go into the abort handler. Uh, but anyway, to ensure the correctness, we need this mechanism. So yeah, this is our, our sec, and this is how it managed to create uh, atomic per CPU operations. So if, the, if you get to the post comment IP, you are sure that uh, the kernel did not preempt you or did not migrate your thread to another CPU. So basically, it was atomic. And uh, yeah, that's it. Um, and this is like an image showing um, on, on our orange, you would have all your uh, uh, critical section instructions. Uh, you can see that the start IP in the end, the post commit IP to uh, the start IP on the start of critical section, the post commit to the end, and another pointer for the abort handler. And also uh, another very interesting usage that was created uh, after RSEC uh, is that, as I said before, every time uh, that your task is scheduled, the, CPU, the, the kernel will um, write in the CPU ID field which is, uh, the number of the CPU that your, your thread is running. And people were like, wait a minute, this is very useful for implementing fast get CPU because uh, usually to know the CPU number that you are running, you will need a syscall for that. But now that we have a uh, data structure that is shared between user space and kernel space, you can just read this structure to know which is your CPU ID. And you, as you can see, uh, some benchmarks on ARM and x86 shows a very huge improvement on just reading, just using RSAC instead of using uh, the syscall get CPU. So nowadays, um, if you're using a, a new version of GDBC, uh, regardless of if you're using or not an RSAC in your program, GDBC will register your thread on the, um, register your thread before running, so it can efficiently cause, uh, do a, a very efficient get CPU if you ever call this in your code. Uh, so, as you can see, our SAC uh, has a very shipping interface to get thread information for the kernel. And this is what, I, what we need, right? Uh, our SAC created a uh, data structure that can be read and written both by the kernel and user space. And reading a uh, structure is way cheaper than uh, messing with syscalls. So, uh, John uh, from LWN. Uh, has suggest suggested to use RSEC to solve our problem. Now back to spin locks. Uh, as I said before, RSEC was created for a different purpose, uh, to uh, do atomic per CPU operations. And, but 
it really suits well for our challenge here. So to have user space pin locks, we need to know if the lock holder is running or not. And what if we add this information to our sec? Because uh, as, as explained, this code already is integrated in the test scheduler and already have an API. So uh, we go to the struct rsec and we add a new pointer to a struct rsec sched state. Uh, and this is the rsec uh, scheduler state. Uh, we have a version, a version uh, member, because uh, it's a good idea to have version members on APIs on the kernel, because if you mess up this API, you don't need to create an, a whole new interface, you just iterate the version and you can expand the member, uh, the struct, or even change the members. And we have the state member that will tell if the thread is running or not, and the thread ID that user space can register. So now we just need to update uh, the state every time that a thread is preempted or migrated. And this is very simple. Uh, as I said before, uh, our sec is already uh, integrated with the scheduler, so every time this thread is going to be printed, you just set the state as zero. And every time the uh, thread is going to be migrated or it will be placed to run, you just uh, flag it as running. And now if, if we connect everything, uh, let's have a look on how a spin lock would look like. So first of all, you try to take the lock. If you manage to do it, you break. It's good. If you don't manage to do that, you check if the lock, the state of the lock owner, and if this state uh, is flagged as running, you continue the loop. You once again will loop and try to take the lock again because you know that uh, if it's running, it's running on some CPU. It's not running on the same CPU that you are running, so you can spin because it's very likely that this lock will be released uh, very soon, so you don't need to sleep. However, uh, if you see that the, the lock owner state is different from running, that means that uh, it's preempted, and if there's no uh, point on spinning, so you're going to sleep. So you just call Futex. Uh, as there's a low path, as is done uh, with mutexes. Uh, does this work? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are working to, uh, to see if uh, we get uh, user spaces, uh, we get good results on user space, we can uh, speed up uh, threads and different workloads. Uh, we need to investigate a little bit of cache optimization to see if the size of the struct is right. We need to integrate that with GLBC P thread locks so we can uh, benchmark a whole uh, GSRO running and spinning to see if it's good and, of course, do a lot of benchmarks. And uh, I think nowadays, uh, you to, to merge something like that on the Linux kernel, you need to provide uh, not only artificial benchmarks, but it's also good to, to have like a common, uh, a more normal case uh, benchmark, uh, because sometimes artificial benchmarks don't really represent uh, what is out there. Uh, Matthew wrote an RFC uh, extending the RSEC with the scheduler state pointer, so you can have a look. And also, um, he implemented uh, on a self, in the self-test, he created a new test, the RSEC mutex, so you can have a look on the code and run it to see if it really works, if it really looks that it's spinning and working. And depending on your GLBC version, you need to have this MVVAR uh, because GLBC has support for RSEC, but not support for uh, the SCAD state, so things can get a little bit uh, mixed. So if you write zero here, you make sure that you are going to use lib, uh, lib rsec instead of the glbc support. So to make sure that it will work. So that's it. Uh, 
thank you very much. And do you have questions? So the question is, why would we use a syscall for to get the CPU number? Yeah. Why is this, why was the device actually necessary? Oh, okay. So. Why would that not be a initial way to get the CPU? Uh, good question. I think no one ever wanted to create an uh, interface just for getting the CPU really faster. Uh, I don't. I don't think that uh, maybe this wasn't bothering someone that much to create an. Uh, mechanism for that. But the thing is, uh, after RSEC, after someone created a whole infrastructure uh, for the per CPU, uh, the get CPU was free. Uh, we get the get CPU for free, you know, without the need to invent anything. This was just a consequence of RSEC and it was already merged. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure why no one ever did that, but I believe no one ever uh, wanted to, to investigate that deep. But now that we have our SAC, uh, we don't need to do a lot to implement that. Would you correct to say that there was like substantial work to create this parse structure and all these structures required? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you need to, to do some work. And uh, yeah, it's not trivial to, to, get our SAC to get their SAC implemented. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, R seek is uh, so you're saying that uh, R sec is the same as spin locks? Uh, yeah, if you if you are doing like per CPU operation, uh, yeah, you just can just use R sec. But uh, if you are competing uh, with uh, if, if you can make sure that the pre-CPU operation, if you have more threads in CPU, then you would need to spin. Um, sorry, can you repeat? As far as sorry, virtualization? Virtual machines, okay. Okay, so on virtual machines, you have the problem <coughs> of one lock per application, right? And uh, and what's the next part? Okay, right. For virtual machines. A lot of waiters per application, okay. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how this 
uh, problem uh, translates on for virtualization. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so uh, the next waiter is not uh, on the CPU. Not in CPU. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, do we have more questions or comments? Okay, so the question is, what, why do you need to speed up? Uh, which problem do you want to use with spin locks, right? So it's, this is very useful when the critical section is very short and uh, you have a lot of uh, a contention. And because nowadays, uh, people, this is a long stand problem. People are trying to solve that, I don't know, for 10 years, uh, I think. Uh, because people have measured in a lot of different ways that doing the contact switch uh, is way bigger than just waiting for uh, the lock to be free. But as I showed before, uh, nowadays we're not, we, 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 can't, we can spin, but you can't spin correctly. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I can't point exactly the example, but a lot of mutexes can uh, just can switch for spin locks. Uh, mostly if the critical section is very short. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes. Right. So, um, having short critical section is, in my mind, actually more something which you should look at, but you really need spin locks or new text in general, whether right? you should move to some more advanced uh, coding technology and techniques, as you just said, like whatever our solutions are. Right. So, the question is uh, maybe it's not uh, spin lock uh, a general solution, right? Because uh, maybe you are ahead to have uh, short critical sections but uh, you depend on the hardware and they are very unpredictable. Uh, so yeah, I think the idea is to have a different uh, locking mechanism. Oops. So um, the user can uh, go ahead and benchmark and choose which one is uh, better. But I think having spin locks on the table is a tool to be used. And I believe some cases will definitely benefit. Uh, okay, I think this is it. Thank you.